summoned daddy. I had such epiphany, real, real soul connection when we had our conversation that in chapter 19, I wrote um, a little bit, just a tiny bit of what I captured with you. Chapter 19 is the title is leaving a legacy, lighting the path for future leaders. leaders. And I quote your wisdom when you say, leadership is not about one person at a helm. It's about nurturing ideas, steering collectives and inspiring organization to flourish. You then say that leadership should be an all encompassing force that values the contribution of every individual. This is a music in my ears. Now, here's my question. This might sound like a common sense, but it's definitely not a common practice. Can you explain why this? you think this is important as we're moving forward, uh, not only through the fourth industrial revolution, but really we're heading fast into the fifth industrial revolution where technology meets humanity. Uh, Runa, thank you very much for, for this invitation. And I uh, see that we have many things in common, but one of the nicest ones is that uh, you wrote the book for your granddaughter, and I participate in many of these events for my granddaughters. So <laughs> that, is, uh, that, is, uh, that is why legacy matters. That is why legacy is on our minds. Uh, I think there are several reasons uh, for doing this beyond just common sense. But I think also to remind us that it has always been the case. You know, if you look at war movies, there is always a scene where the general or the leader gets on his horse and uh, gives a pep talk and an inspirational talk. Uh, and the purpose of it is to get them to boost their morale and get them ready actually to even give their lives, if necessary, for a cause. Uh, this is inspiring a community of people to flourish by reminding them of the untapped capacity that is in them. So this, this, this is not only for the fourth and fifth and other coming industrial revolutions. It is part of human reality. But it's, that old style had an assumption, and that assumption was the leader knew and the others did not. The leader had experience. The leader had, had been to wars before. The leader knew about strategy, knew about history. So there was almost a monopoly of knowledge, and therefore everybody looked up to the one who knew in order to benefit from that knowledge. That knowledge brought power with it. But what society has done now with the advances that we have with innovation and large-scale access to knowledge, that monopoly has been eroded. The leader is no more the one who knows everything. It's not the repository of knowledge. And that is why access to knowledge is the right of every human being in our time and participation in its generation, application and diffusion is a responsibility that all must shoulder in the great enterprise of building a prosperous world civilization. And each individual will do that according to his or her talents and abilities because justice demands universal participation. Now, uh, I can compare the process of the evolution of societies to that of a human being. At the beginning, it's just a seed, then a fetus, then a baby, and eventually a mature being. Its needs, capacities, and challenges evolve over time. Mm -hmm. This has happened in the style of leadership also. A child needs the parents to lead, preferably by example, but at the time, as the time goes by and maturity approaches, parents need to create the conditions for children to exercise more and more agency. It is then that children will start to co-create with parents. And in the same manner, the leader does not need any more to know everything, but create the conditions for the team to discover what is needed. Because we do not know what is needed. We have to discover it. Yeah. And that is, I think, also 
the one of the big challenges of our universities. They don't know what to prepare students for because by definition, the future is unknown and more than in the past. Such wisdom in that. Yeah, thank you. In my second question in the book, I share your profound wisdom around ethical leadership and building trust. Can you tell us more about that concept and how you see that being one of the vital roles in leadership moving forward? First of all, I, I would not engage in a theoretical conversation about the definition of, of ethics, but in a very practical way. I think ethics is about coherence or balance or equilibrium, whichever way you want, or even harmony if you want. This is because in practice, we are never confronted with a fact in isolation. It's always in a context. One simple example, in Colombia, after 60 years of war, the government came to an agreement with the FARC in order to create peace. The fundamental value or principle the government had was to reach peace as fast as possible. When that agreement was put to public approval, it was denied because the fundamental value that people had in their mind was justice. So it's easy to talk about peace or justice individually and in abstract. The complication or the ethical aspect of it comes when you put them together and you find the right balance, the right coherence. So we are living in a world where coherence can be found at all levels, starting with individuals. Are we living actually the question in a world where there is coherence within individuals, institutions, and communities? I guess not. So what we need is to do a little bit of rethinking. So the ethical aspect of it is to rethink a number of things. For example, definition of success. Isn't our definition of success a one-way materialistic approach even when we do evaluation of people in the in in the office at the end of the at the end of the year we look at their sales we look at their contribution to profit etc yeah. but le- there there is a simple way to look at it differently we can evaluate people not based as we do in football not based on the number of goals they made but the goals they assisted yeah. it's already done it's a little change of paradigm that you refer to also a little nudge in our way of looking at things in order to move from an incoherent black and white, as it was just said, in the box or out the box, as we also have had many conversations with you and Nick uh, that I immensely enjoyed, but looking at it in a slightly different way. And, you know, uh, also referring to the quantum uh, uh, multi-level, multiverse, Actually, before going to such complicated things at quantum, I would like us to remember that we live in a multiverse world from the day we are born, most of us, because we have two eyes. With one, we do not see depth. So the fact that things are not either or, but a combination of things that are put together in the best way is also in the physical reality of how we see things. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to trust, Trust is something that I need to develop within my organization by first being trustworthy. This is what we have seen. I have seen in my organizations and I've seen with organizations with which we work uh, at Seoul. It's all about creating the conditions again. I come back to that. The conditions for others to develop their capacity. If they have the opportunity to develop their capacity, trust will emerge because they will realize that this is the best contribution to what they need to do. Each one of us need to develop our inherent capacities. Listening, fundamental question of trust goes hand in hand with listening. Again, the problem of polarization that, you know, just, uh, you know, you simplify things because people don't need to listen. As soon as you open your mouth, they know what you're going to say. They know it is simple and they know that you don't need to think. And therefore, developing the capacity to listen. Yeah. Finally, the capacity that we all need to develop is to challenge our assumptions. Yeah. If, we manage, if we manage just to start, 
with an effort. And it can be learned over time. It's a practice. It's a yoga of breathing, <laughs> okay? And we all breathe all the time, but we want to breathe better. We take yoga class courses or others. Uh, let's imagine ourselves every day thinking of one challenge of my, uh, one assumption of mind that I want to challenge today. That will create trust around us. Oh, I love that. And yeah, the our assumptions, holy moly. They are endlessly. Thank you so much. That is so good.